thank you so much, Jen, for that fabulous introduction, and uh, and thank you also to Laurie Ann. Um, it's it's a, it's always a thrill to be here at the National Women's History Museum. What you do is so important, telling women's stories, um, and especially you know women that many of us may not have heard of otherwise. I'm so excited that you wanted me to share Beautiful Shades of Brown, The Art of Laura Wheeler Wearing. This is the first picture book about her. And, um, and you know, at the end of the book, you're going to see some of her paintings. Well, actually you'll see her paintings sprinkled throughout thanks to the marvelous illustrations of Felicia Marshall who worked with Laura Wheeler Wearing's actual paintings to reproduce them throughout the book. I know. It, and, um, and, and before I read, I, I do want you to think about Felicia Marshall's illustrations and some of the amazing things she did, which is another thing we can talk about. It's called Beautiful Shades of Brown. And even if you look at the title, look at what she did with brown, the different shades of brown to write the word brown. And you're gonna see marvelous things she does with this amazing color all throughout. Um, again, I'm so glad to share this with you. This is one of those stories I fell in love with Laura Wheel wearing after seeing one of her paintings, which you will see in the book. And I hope it will make you fall in love with her too. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. Everyone ready? All right. Let's do this. Okay, let me bear with me while I share my screen. Now, art can make such a difference in changing hearts and minds. And Laura grew up in a difficult time, as you'll see. Beautiful Shades of Brown, The Art of Laura Wheel of Wearing by Nancy Chernin. That means I wrote the words, illustrated by Felicia Marshall, whom I, I hope you'll fall in love with as much as I have, because she has really channeled this amazing artist. Okay. Beautiful Shades of Brown. Laura loved the color brown. She loved her mother's chocolate colored hair, her father's caramel coat, and all the different browns in the cheeks of her younger sister and brothers. And by the way, take a moment to look at what she's doing in that, in that picture, what she sketched out. All right, now let's see what happens on the next page. Some languages have 50 words for snow, she thought, swirling a brush in a puddle of chestnut paint. There should be 50 words for brown. It was hard to get each shade right. Laura dabbed a spot of paint on her skin. It didn't match at all. Not until she added some red and yellow. Maybe you didn't see brown in a rainbow, she thought. But brown was a rainbow with orange and blue, red and green tucked inside, playing hide and seek. And by the way, look at that painting she finished. Do you remember how she sketched it out on the page before? All right. Let's see. Laura spent hours mixing and blending, trying for the precise shade of the russet crinkles by her father's eyes and the coffee colored creases in her mother's hands. She bribed her sister and brothers with peppermints to sit while she tried to capture all their colors. One day she dreamed her paintings would hang in museums and everyone would see how much color brown could hold. By the way, take a close look at what her brother is holding in his hand, sticking in his mouth. She used to carry those candies in her pockets all the time. That was a crazy idea for a 10 year old in Connecticut in 1897. African Americans had separate neighborhoods, churches and schools. Nobody was going to put paintings of African Americans on museum walls. Laura was young, but she was determined. Maybe there weren't portraits of African Americans in museums yet, but she could turn her room into a gallery. At least there, her sister and brothers could see pictures of people with all different shades of brown smiling back at them. All through high school, Laura wanted only one thing, to go to a real art school, a place where she could learn to get the images she saw in her head out onto canvas. She applied to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. It was far from home, expensive, and nearly all white. 
when she got the acceptance letter, there was no question. Laura would get a job if she had to, but she would go. The academy was a good start, but Laura was hungry to learn more, to be around real artists. Everyone knew there was only one place to study art, Paris. Laura worked hard and won a scholarship. Clutching her paint box, she boarded a ship. Just like at school, nearly everyone around her was white but her sketchbook was filled with portraits of people she loved with luminous brown tones she didn't want to forget. In Paris, Laura visited museums and studied the paintings of Monet, Manet, and Cezanne. She set up her easel in the Jeu de Palme and copied the green skin of Lautrec singers, the blue faces of Matisse's women, the caramel bodies, of Gauguin's Tahitians. All the different ways people could be painted reminded Laura of what she'd wanted from the start, to paint portraits like the people she knew, people full of beautiful shades of brown. Back home in Philadelphia, Laura heard about a young African-American singer performing Handel's Messiah at Union Baptist Church. Marian Anderson was just a teenager, but when she walked out on stage, she held her head as high as a queen. Then Marian sang, and she didn't sound young at all. Laura's eyes filled with tears. It was as if she was hearing what she had been trying to paint for so long. Marian's nose rose and danced about her beautiful shades of brown. One day, I'm going to paint Mary and Anderson, Laura promised herself. Paris had made Laura's painting more bold and confident. News spread about the remarkable artist whose subjects breathes on canvas. In 1944, the director of the Harmon Foundation told Laura they wanted to build a collection of portraits of important African-Americans. Would Laura like to paint them? Yes, she would. Laura painted journalist and activist Alice Dunbar Nelson with ebony brown gloves on her rosy brown skin, proud in a bright yellow dress. She painted Broadway lyricist and poet James Weldon Johnson, a dashing dark mustache on his sensitive face. She painted educator and writer W.E.B. Du Bois wearing a warm brown suit and smoky topaz tie, holding sorrel colored glasses. Now take just a second to see her painting these paintings. Do you know what? At the end, you're gonna see Laura Wheeler wearing actual paintings. And that is what she painted. But Felicia Marshall is showing it in progress. Another thing I want you to look at Look at Felicia Marshall's illustrations. Look at the colors she uses to paint these illustrations. Do you notice her beautiful shades of brown? Okay. Laura was looking for more subjects when she saw a familiar name in the news. Marian Anderson had just been invited to sing at the White House, the first African-American to do so. Marion's music was breaking down walls. Could a portrait by Laura break down walls too? Laura asked Marion if she would sit for a portrait. Yes, she would. Day after day, Marion posed. Laura mixed shades of brown, burnt umber with yellow and dabs of white. No. That wasn't it. How about a little green and violet? Closer. Laura wiped her paint spattered forehead. Traces of red and cerulean blue? Laura looked at Marion and saw again the teenager singing so soulfully years ago. She heard again the music in all its beautiful shades of brown. She felt the melody travel down her fingers as she dipped her brush into the paints of her palette and found the exact luminous shade of Marion's beautiful brown skin. 
her gown, the room. Laura put down her brush. She held her breath as Marion studied the painting, hoping the great singer would see her spirit mirrored there. Marion smiled. Yes, she did. People flocked to see Flora's paintings as they traveled around the country. Oh, after the tour, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. hung Laura's paintings in the National Portrait Gallery. Now her paintings weren't hidden in her bedroom, but hung in gilt frames on the walls of a real museum. Now everyone could see the rainbow shining through each tone of brown. And children, like her nieces and nephews, could see faces like theirs and how beautiful they were. And here are reproductions of Laura Wheeler Wearing's actual paintings. The painting of Marian Anderson is the painting that first made me fall in love with Laura Wheeler Wearing and made me determined to find out everything I could about her. And then I saw these other paintings, each of a great person, and it made me love her even more. My gratitude to um, the uh, granddaughter of uh, Laura Wheeler Waring's brother, because Laura Wheeler Waring never had children of her own. She was devoted to her nieces and nephews. And Madeline Murphy Rabb is the granddaughter of uh, Laura's brother and gave us permission along with the Smithsonian to reproduce these actual paintings. I hope you will love them as much as I do. And now I think we're ready for questions. Do you have some questions for me? Well, Nancy, thank you so much. What a delight that book is, and it's so inspiring. I'm, I'm so grateful you've joined us today. If you have questions, everyone, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, we will answer them. Um, I'll check the chat too, but just try to put them in the Q&A. We want to hear your thoughts on the book. We'd, we'd love to hear um, what resonated with you most, what you like to, to learn about with Laura. Uh, so I'm going to kick it off. Can you talk a little bit, Nancy, about what inspired you to write this book and how you came across Laura's great artwork? Yes, well, I'm a big fan of um, art museums. I mean, I love art. I love art. And it seemed to me that um, while I love art so much, most of the paintings that I see in museums are by male artists. And I just felt that women are very underrepresented. So I was thinking about um, how I want to shine a light. As, you know, one of my missions is to find people that have not gotten the recognition that they deserve and people also change the world for the better. And so I found that there are a handful of wonderful women artists who get written about over and over again. Um, I, I adore Georgia O'Keeffe, I adore Mary Cassatt, um, Frida Kahlo. Um, they are absolutely fabulous and they deserve the attention they get, but they have been written about a lot. And I thought there have to be a lot more women out there who did amazing paintings. And I was kind of on the search. And that's when I uh, came across this painting of Marian Anderson, which, uh, and I, went, oh. first of all, I love Marian Anderson, the, the great singer and um, how she used her voice, which was a thing of beauty also to break down walls. And in a way, you know, we all have our ways of fighting for justice and equality and hers was to use her voice and to bring people together of all races um, to, to hear her sing. And when I discovered Laura Wheeler Waring's painting of her, um, I, I was determined to know more and at first, it was frustrating because I couldn't find anything about her. No one had written a book about her. Uh, so I, I actually went on a detective hunt and, you know, found out that her paintings were in the Smithsonian. And the, uh, the curators there were so kind to me, Aaron Beasley in particular, um, at the Smithsonian, provided me with so much information. And I thank three curators there uh, who were wonderful. And, and the more I learned about Laura, the more I loved her and realized why she did what she did because like Marion, she was also fighting for social justice with her, mm -hmm. but with her paintbrush. 
Laura was not much of a speaker. She didn't, you know, I think her parents, they were, you know, they, they stood up, they gave speeches. She had preachers in the family. They were very vocal. She was very shy, but she spoke loudly through her paintbrush. What she saw was that on museum walls, you didn't see people of color. You didn't see people that looked like the people that she admired, people in her family, uh, people who had accomplished great things. And she was determined to use her skills to change that. And indeed she did. And so again, the more I learned about her, the more I was determined to write about her. And, um, and it was so important to me to have the blessing of her family in doing that and the, um, and the help of the Smithsonian because I wanted it to be something that her family would indeed be proud of. And actually, one thing that's so cool is that one of her descendants, I mean, not, again, not direct, but through the siblings, uh, Madeline Murphy Rabb's son, Representative Chris Rabb, has read this to his constituents. Oh. I know I have that on, on Facebook, and you'll find that on my page, my uh, Beautiful Shades <clears throat> of Brown. You also found, find the free teacher's guide resources and all that. That meant a lot to me. So yes, that's what led me down there was uh, wanting to shine a light. And then I just found some, a person more amazing than I even anticipated. That's amazing. Uh, her story was, you know, it was just such a gift and it's been such a joy uh, to write about her, um, to learn about her, to be inspired by her and to be reminded we all have to find our own unique gifts, our own ways of making a difference. And one way is not the same as another. She didn't have the big voice of, uh, of the preachers in her family. But boy, she certainly had a mighty paintbrush, didn't she? That's incredible. We have a couple of questions so far. Deanna mm -hmm. asks, are any of her paintings in any museum in Clearwater, Florida or Tampa, Florida? And I, I guess that opens up a bigger question. Where else can people find her paintings? Oh, that is a great question. I, I don't know where all the paintings are. And I, I that would be fantastic if you found some there, or if you ask for them to get to be uh, uh, to be honestly. there. You know, I really think there ought to be a Laura Wheeler wearing exhibition that travels again. Honestly, um, the the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where she studied, um, has a, a couple of her paintings that were given as a gift by one of their benefactors, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. And um, I. I, I'm, I will put that on my page for you to see that, a, a copy of that painting. But yes, um, they're commonly called PAFA is, is their, their acronym. Um, I do believe when I was doing my research, I may have found one in a, um, at a museum in Brooklyn. Um, just, I, I would have to go back and look as these things travel. Also, there was a wonderful exhibit um, of, uh, of great African-American art that toured the country and came through Dallas, which is near where I live. And uh, a couple of her paintings were in that, in that touring exhibit as well. And I'll try and keep my page updated, but I'm also happy to hear from all of you. I have a contact page and if you find a painting out there in the wild, um, or if you ask your museum, hey, why don't you have a Laura Wheeler wearing painting? Um, I think that'd be great. I'd love to hear from you. Well, and I would love if any of our audience members, if you have, um, if you've seen a Laura Wheeler wearing photo, I mean, a photo artwork painting, painting in, in a museum, if you've seen one, let us know. We'd love to hear that as well. Um, so, Soraya asks, which is your favorite painting by Laura? Oh, well, you know, I, I always find it hard to play favorites, honestly, and probably that changes, but the Marian Anderson painting, is the one that brought me to her. I almost feel, you know, that old siren song, except, you know, sirens, how sirens sing and they, they bring you to their side. I mean, in the Greek mythology, it all ends badly. This ends wonderfully because it was the siren song of Marian Anderson, the great singer. Look at how regal she is. So beautiful. Look, is that, it, it's just extraordinary. And I just felt like she captured her spirit, her soul. Um, she was like a queen. She really was, and she caught that in her. And so that's the one that brought me to her. So I think that'll always be extra special, but I have loved studying each and all of these paintings. I mean, you look at this painting of W.E.B. Du Bois and it's like a miracle in brown. 
think about how much easier it would have been to paint the picture with different colors, to put a different colored suit on him, um, to have different colors on the walls. But look at her brilliance in showing how varied brown is and one color is set off against another, you know, from his skin tone to his suit to his, the wall it, it's, and his glasses. It's just exquisite. And it's also a reminder of how unique we all are. Nobody looks exactly like anybody else. And part of the problems we have in the world is when people will... Um, talk about certain groups as if they are uniform or homogenous and not celebrate the diversity even within groups because we are all unique. So no, I love them all. And this is also an opportunity for you to learn about more great people because I mean, I set out to put on a, a spotlight on this great um, black artist, but here you can find out about even more um, a great black thinkers, artists, um, you know, people who contribute so much to our world. And that's another thing, very often in February during Black History Month, we see the same half a dozen uh, people profiled right. all the time. And I hope this will give you ideas for more people that we need to learn more about, in addition to Laura Wheeler Waring. You know, speaking of uncovered history, we just, um, our friends at Ford's Theater just did a show, their first show back um, after COVID, uh, well, COVID's still going on, but um, they resumed in-person shows and it was called, I think it's, it's called My Lord, What a Night. And it was about the friendship between Marian Anderson and Albert Einstein. Fascinating, fascinating I story. I wrote that book, Lisa Rose. Look at that. <laughs> by Carban. It's, a, it's just wonderful. I mean, and we need these books about friendship, people standing up for each other. And that is wonderful, beautiful. Okay. So, um, uh, Teresa, thank you for your comment. Um, Teresa noted that this book is really wonderful and will help children appreciate beauty and people who are underrepresented. Um, it will really help children feel completely different about the color brown. And you've, you've done that so beautifully through this book. And it's um, such an inspiring story. Um, but turning away from Laura's story, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey as an author and what advice you might have for young learners who want to write books themselves. The, the first and most important thing I would say is to follow your heart. I mean, we were talking about how each of us is unique. I mean, from, the, from our skin color, nobody's skin is exactly the same. Um, uh, it's also true for our gifts, for our voice, for what we have. And I would say, um, try and find out what it is that you want to say and how you want to say it. You can learn a lot. If you want to be a writer, you know, we always say read a lot, but see what attracts you. Um, I'm saying to read, not to copy, but because you learn and you get comfortable with the form the same way Laura wanted to be a great artist. She just didn't just paint something and send it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> she spent years studying and, you know, at, at, at the Pennsylvania Academy of, of Fine Arts and then in Paris, and she became a teacher herself. So she, but yet she painted, th ended up painting things that no one had painted before, painted people that no one had painted before. So find out what it is you want to say. Maybe you want to say something funny. Maybe you want to say something serious. Maybe there's this, you have something to say about social justice. Think about what you want to say. Maybe you feel underrepresented or you feel that other people you know are underrepresented and you want to get their faces and stories in those books. Um, know what you want to say. Read around to see people who are doing the kind of thing you like to do, but don't get discouraged if they've done it because no one can do it the way you can do it. Each voice is unique. The way you tell your story is unique um, and just go for it. Study, find like-minded friends join a writer's group. Um, if you're in school, maybe have a little book or writing club where you meet afterwards and you exchange stories and comment on each other's work. Uh, a teacher who loves creative writing and can help guide and encourage you as well. Um, boy, I, I wish I'd had creative writing uh, book groups when I was in school. It took me a long time as an adult to find my path um, because I had no idea how you could become a writer. 
But now I think there are a lot of writers who are generous with their time. I even, in my local library, I teach a class in picture book writing for kids. Um, oh my gosh. For, yes. Lucky and it's kids. so popular. It's such a popular class. And at the end, the, and the librarian who leads it is so wonderful. She makes sure that all the stories are bound up at the end and they become books in the library that you can even check out Amazing. so libraries schools can do this kind of thing and encourage young writers thank you for that that's that's such great advice can you um before we close is it, are there any projects that you can share with us that you're working on now or any any um maybe subject areas you want to take on in future books well as i said i'm always looking for what moves my heart um, my, my two, I've been writing more about courageous women and these two books, uh, are my most recent. So I'm sort of shout, and I got to share this at the, uh, at the Women's History Museum. This is, this was my first visit with you. We remember um, that was so fantastic. Yes. And then this is the story of Henrietta Zold, who, uh, saved 11,000 children during the Holocaust. Wow. Uh, Yes, founded Hadassah, which continues to help people today. Um, and that I, came out recently, right? Like very October, recent. These are my two recent books. You know, I and as a matter of fact, I'm coming back to the museum for this one. You have invited me back in May. Yay. Yay. And I'm going to be sharing her story. Yes, yes, she was born in in, in Maryland. She's a local girl, and um, and she was just somebody who, whenever she saw a problem. She wanted to come up with a solution. It didn't matter that she grew up at a time when they said women can't do this, women can't do that. She would just see a problem and solve it. Immigrants couldn't get jobs to know the language. She starts the first night school in America. There weren't enough um, Jewish books in the US. She becomes the first uh, person to run the Jewish Publication Society. And during World War II, when she saw kids at risk, well, so many at risk, she did what she could. She took a boat to the heart. She's in her 70s, takes a boat to the heart of Nazi Germany. Is that crazy or what? what an incredible and she, story. Um, she gets visas, yes, and she saves 11,000 children, not just saves them, but finds them houses, food, uh, education, checks on them. She, like Laura Willow Waring, never had children, but she became the mother truly to 11,000. Oh, Nancy, and thank you. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. We can't wait so, to have you back. And um, to everyone that's I'm so excited here, to hear, what a, what a treat this was. This was so great. I hope everybody goes and looks for Laura's artwork, her paintings, her beautiful, beautiful paintings in museums. Um, please do let Nancy know if you find one when you're out and about at museums. Um, we'd love to hear not just about where you found it, but what you thought of it and, and um, how it moved you. So let us know, do reach out. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. We look forward to having you again in February. We're going to do um, a special Chinese New Year's celebration themed uh, Brave Girls. And so um, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you so much, Nancy.